Welcome everyone to the Fermentation Association's webinar of global fermentation today and tomorrow. I'm Amelia Nielsen Stoll, editor of TFA. We are a trade group that was launched to support producers who use fermentation to create delicious and often healthful food and beverages. Our goals are to help educate consumers about fermentation and its benefits, support scientific research into those health benefits, and work with food safety authorities to establish clearer and more appropriate regulations in regards to fermentation. Today, we bring you two great speakers, Lisa Moeller, international food industry expert, and Dr. Fred Bright, microbiologist at USDA Agriculture Research Service. We have many questions already submitted and reviewed with our speakers. If there are additional topics you'd like to see addressed, please enter them in the chat below and we will try to get to them. All right, Fred, I will turn it over to you to introduce Lisa. Thank you very much. Um, you know, uh, to me, this, this talk I think is gonna be really exciting because um, I've known Lisa for about 15 years. She's uh, one of the um, premier uh, pickle people uh, in the United States in terms of industrial fermentations. Um, she, uh, she grew up in California, got her uh, BS in agronomy from UC Davis. Um, for more than 25 years, I think, or so, she worked for one of the largest pickle companies in the United States, uh, with Vineyard, with over a thousand, uh, ten thousand gallon tanks, um, as as the as the tank yard uh, supervisor, quality control person, and uh, worked on environmental compliance and things like that. Um, in 2012, uh, Lisa came to our lab here, uh, we're USDA, but we're located at NC State University in the food science department. And she came and got her master's degree with the um, former director of our group, Dr. Roger McPeters. Um, and so she got a master's in food chemistry with us. Uh, so we know Lisa pretty well. Um, and in about in the past seven years or so, um, she has uh, started her own company and she works with pickle companies around the world, um, doing a variety of uh, consulting and other type of uh, operations with them. Uh, she's traveled to uh, Asia, uh, um, Europe, Africa, um, North and South America, pretty much everywhere. Um, and uh, working on a variety of different kinds of fermentations. Um, and, uh, but when she's not out roaming around, she's at home uh, on a farm in North Carolina, where um, uh, similar to where she's talking to us from now. So, um, Lisa, um, I'm excited to hear your talk. Why don't I turn the floor over to you and uh, launch it off? Thank you so much, Fred, for that introduction. I'm uh, going ahead, going to go ahead and get my screen set up here, so I can start sharing. I have a a formal presentation I'd like to uh, go through with you. I, I'm excited to be presenting today on a topic I'm passionate about and one that has taken me around the world, global fermentation today and tomorrow. I want to give a special thank you to Fred, Neil, and Amelia for their review and comments and encouragement for this presentation. Today, we are going to be discussing past trends, future forecasts, and some new processes and ways of handling food. It is truly amazing how many fermented foods we eat daily without thinking of the processes to make these possible. I listed the categories on the Fermentation Association website, and I also included the 2020 USDA food pyramid, which has as its base vegetables. Today, cucumbers dominate the fermented vegetable category. We thought it would be interesting for me to describe the differences between these three processed cucumber categories that are called pickles. Prior to 1942, almost all cucumber products on grocery shelves were fermented only. Relish, tartar sauce, Thousand Island dressing all contained fermented cucumbers. Likewise, most shelf-stable sweet and super sweet products are made from fermented cucumbers. 
when you realize it is estimated that 50 billion burgers are consumed each year in the United States, you begin to realize just how big the fermented cucumber category is. A large part of the pickle industry is still involved with fermented cucumbers, but is not the leader in the, firm, in the category at this time. In 1858, John Landis Mason patented the mason jar. He was a tinsmith and invented the screw on lid. In 1862, Louis Pasteur discovered pasteurization. The acidified category uses a fermented liquid, usually vinegar, to lower the pH and then often pasteurizes. Product that is acidified on the retail shelf is usually labeled fresh pack to acknowledge these differences. The third category is refrigerated. Refrigerated pickles are acidified and not pasteurized. Globally, this limits them as refrigeration is not as possible in other parts of the world. Refrigerated products have become more popular recently in the United States. They are often very tasty and have minimal ingredients and appear fresh but these refrigerated products require constant refrigeration through it, though and have a short shelf life compared to the fermented and acidified products. I added this slide yesterday because I think lots of times when we're fermenting items, we really don't think about the process from the beginning to the end. Fermentation is a transfer of energy. I rode to Wilmington this morning on fossil fuel. Stored energy originally from the sun, one million year old energy stored deep in the earth's crust, originally from plants, plants and algae. Today, that same sun is allowing us to harvest energy in the form of photosynthesis. These harvested grains, fruits, and vegetables can then all be used by microorganisms to convert that energy to further the stability and create healthier options and complement our diets through fermented products. Since this presentation centers on vegetables, I wanted to discuss globally the most popular vegetables tomatoes, onions, cucumbers, cabbage, eggplant, carrots and turnips, and peppers. These vegetables are common on all continents. They are all row cropped or grown in greenhouses. Cucumbers and carrots are interesting as they take only 60 days from seed to consumption. I listed these most popular vegetables in metric tons, millions, I'm sorry, millions, of metric tons. 72 million metric tons of cucumbers is a huge number. If 72 million metric tons of cucumbers were laid end to end, they would reach to the moon over 120 times back and forth. This is one year's harvest. Cucumbers have very little odor until they are cut. Once the cucumber is cut, oxygen quickly reacts with several acids in the fruit and the odor given off is that that we think of as cucumber. Fresh cucumbers are 95% water and generally, are generally around 2% sugar. These level of sugars are ideal for creating a complete fermentation with a 50-50 to 70-30 mix of cucumbers to brine. This historically may be why it became so popular as a fermentation vegetable. And why is this so important? Because cucumbers with a characteristic flavor and odor when fresh can uniquely be turned into a blank palate that can take on many flavors when fermented. This is unique to cucumbers. I can turn a fermented cucumber into a product that tastes like pineapple, 
blueberry, raspberry. On the other hand, onions, tomatoes, peppers, and carrots carry their unique flavor profile with them through the fermentation process and storage. Next time you eat a McDonald's hamburger and get a bite of the pickle, close your eyes and 25 seconds later, the dill from the chip will still linger in your mouth. Both the texture and the flavor of fermented cucumbers contribute to a food ex experience and are important. Sauerkraut and kimchi production is also at 72 million metric tons. I included pictures of the round head cabbage. It's often turned into sauerkraut, but also the Napa cabbage that's often turned into kimchi. According to recent reported SPINS data from these Fermentation Association webinars, kimchi now makes up 7% of the fermented food category, but sales increased 90% in the past year. Different microorganisms than those that are responsible for most cucumber fermentations are necessary to produce high quality finished products for this category. In Turkey and the Balkans, I have enjoyed beautifully fermented cabbage cut in large pieces or fermented as whole leaves, and it is delicious. Tomatoes, onions, cucumbers, and cabbage may top in yields, but increased production of other vegetables is interesting to evaluate. Currently, there is increased production for sweet potatoes, kale, fresh cut herbs, ginseng, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts. Each of these has multiple uses and health benefits. On the other hand, they are more labor intensive than the traditionally common vegetables. Since we are discussing global conditions, it is exciting to learn where the largest populations reside. I chose to look at all the populations that had over 150 million people. And kind of to my surprise, this just represented eight countries. But when you take this, the population of these eight countries, it represents 55% of the world's population. And the world's population is expected to grow by 27% in 2050. When I asked many people what they thought the most populated countries were, China, India, and US came up on the list. Brazil, sometimes, but most people didn't understand how large the populations of Indonesia, Pakistan, Nigeria, and Bangladesh also were. I included the data for density people per square kilometer because I thought there was such a big difference in these numbers. In Brazil, there's on average 25 people per square kilometer compared to Bangladesh, 1,265 people per square kilometer. I also looked at these number in terms of land mass. When we're talking about vegetables, we're interested in how many acres folks have that they can grow crops. And it was interesting by land mass, the top four ranked Russia, Canada, China, and the US. The next four slides are pictures I took while shopping around the world. This picture is from Northern Africa. Folks bought in bulk, they bought local, they bought in season, they bought fresh, they bought dried, they bought fermented, but there was limited refrigeration. Likewise in India, India has many markets, but also folks are buying in season and bulk. On my last visit there, it was interesting to note that the Indian government had banned plastic bags. And I had recognized driving through the country that I didn't see as much trash. And you can see some of the folks in this picture are Eric actually carrying reusable bags. This was definitely a big improvement. I had a residency permit in Turkey for two and a half of the past five years. The lower left picture represents a typical Turkish breakfast, coffee, tea, fermented and fresh produce. 
The picture in the center represents new irrigated land being developed for cucumbers and jalapenos. All I could think about when, was when I was in this region was this must have been what the Sacramento and San Joaquin valleys looked like years ago when irrigation was just getting popular. Turkey's markets have both local and seasonal produce as well as many fermented and acidified retail products with many brands. The vegetable manufacturing plants have strict environmental quality and social audits and transportation and hot meals are provided to all employees daily. And this is quite in contrast to the US markets. So I took these pictures over the last couple of weeks. Um, US markets, unlike most global shopping options, offer many selections in every category, a lot of packaging and large refrigerated and frozen sections. Americans expect and, and are comfortable with more choices. Americans are able to get almost any type of produce year round. I'm comfortable eating Spanish food tonight, Greek tomorrow, and hamburgers the next night, but that isn't typical of all the different regions of the world. You can see from the previous slides that there truly is no such thing as global taste buds. But there is successful product adaptations, and I'm going to discuss four I think are important. The first adaptation is adapting flavors for regional differences. KFC used to be called Kentucky Fried Chicken but they took the Kentucky and the fried out of their name. 23,000 restaurants in over 114 countries. In 2007, I had KFC in India and it tasted nothing like the KFC I had in Mount Olive, but it was delicious. Adopting flavors to markets is important for startups and established facilities. The second adaptation I'd like to mention is multiple choices. Coca-Cola is a popular brand, 500 in over 200 countries. The US represents only 31.9% of Coca-Cola's revenue. It doesn't taste the same in Mexico as it does in the United States. The third adaptation is aggressive marketing. Heinz has been clever in their marketing and packaging. Heinz owns 80% of the EU and 60% of the US ketchup market share. It is critical to know what makes your product different, special, and desirable. The fourth and last adaptation I'm gonna talk about is size matters. Procter & Gamble recognizes that size matters. Individuals in many areas can't afford large containers because of the cost and transportation. For them, packaging choices are critical. Procter & Gamble spent more than $4 billion last year on marketing and understands their consumers. My stock in Procter & Gamble has a 27% annualized rate of return to date, and they continue to be a category leader. This slide shows favorite Thanksgiving side dishes by state, where we recognize there's no such thing as a global taste bud. There are also no national preferences when it comes to the favorite Thanksgiving side dishes. We had our holiday a few weeks ago, and when surveyed, people preferred many different dishes, over 15 regional preferences in just 50 states. This slide represents the grocery stores with the highest dollar sales value in the United States. The six pointed star is Walmart. There has been a great consolidation of chains. So for example, the Kroger company now owns Harris Teeter, King Scooper, Smith's, as well as Kroger. This may be the 
most important slide when discussing trends. This slide depicts basically grocery store food versus restaurant food. So the lighter green line on the top with the projection headed downwards is food that was purchased from grocery stores and eaten at home. And, and this is the past 23 years, January of 1997 to the first part of this year. The food away from home, the food eaten at grocery stores, not purchased from, or eaten at restaurants, not purchased from grocery stores, the darker line, it's trending up. And somewhere in the last three or, three or four years, these lines cross. Half the food that we ate, we purchased from a grocery store. Half the food we ate, we did not purchase from a grocery store. Somebody else prepared that for us. Then you look far to the right. COVID-19 hit, and this 23-year trend was blown out of the water. April 2020, over 65% of the food that we ate came from the grocery store, and less than 35% of the food we ate was from restaurants. But I think this trend gives the fermented vegetable arena great potential. Fermented vegetables can increase the shelf life of produce, they're nutritious, and they can be turned into a wide variety of flavors. And I think through time, people are gonna be more interested in having a supply of things in their pantry that they can go to when they don't feel comfortable going to the grocery store. There was a lot of questions in previous webinars about no salt fermentation. And I will attempt to address these now. I'm going to give a, a little presentation about traditional versus no salt fermentation pickle brines and products. Traditional fermentation pickle brines generally include to the water, you add salt. This is a hurdle for the undesirable microorganisms. You add calcium chloride, this is added for the crisp and crunch of the final product. You add potassium sorbate. This is a really good preventative from yeast and molds. And in this picture, I put vinegar, but I made the bottle very small. In the past ever, several years, I haven't been invited to three separate continents because where people thought a little vinegar was good, more was better. And basically they stalled the fermentation. So on purpose, the vinegar bottle in this picture is small. A lot of people are surprised by the natural number of microorganisms on cucumbers. Tens of thousands of coliforium units in every square centimeter on the surface of cucumbers. And when these cucumbers are ready to be fermented, this is the traditional fermentation process. You add brine to the bottom of an often a large tank. You introduce cucumbers and fill to nearly the top. And sometimes this is done by overfilling and letting them settle. But you do this then so you can install the headboards. And in the picture on this slide, it, the tank was just put in. And so you can see how the headboards are laid across the top and the boards that are going horizontal in this picture are actually four by fours. You fill the tank with brine to submerge your fruit and then you must purge to prevent bloating of whole cucumbers and to achieve equilibrium in the tank. And a bloater for those of you that don't know is a, um, a cavity that develops in the center of the cucumber and where a lot of these goes for hamburger dill chips, it's undesirable than when the product is cut. Now with these traditional fermentation processes, the type, the size, and the condition of the fruit matter, the temperature of the brine, the rates of purging with either air or nitrogen, and the concentration of salt, potassium sorbate, and calcium chloride all affect the rate of fermentation and the qu final quality of resulting pickles. When you 
when most folks in the industry talk about what is converting these sugars in the cucumbers to lactic acid, most of us talk about lactobacillus plantarum and it doing the majority of the fermentation. But this slide shows that there's a multitude of bacteria that are in these tanks and, and, and they're, um, they're, they're working together on the, on the energy and the cucumbers. But now we have the ability to better understand the microorganisms of bulk fermentations and through time better manage this. I, I think because we're talking about in salt and no salt, I would really encourage all of you to read this book. It's an unbelievable, easy read. But salt has played a big part of our history. Mark writes, it served as currency, influenced wards, trade routes, secured empires, and inspired revolutions. He also writes, salted cucumbers to a barrel add sand, black currant leaves, dill, and horseradish. Mix one and a half pounds of salt in one pail of water and keep cucumbers submerged. Mark took this quote out of a Russian cookbook called A Gift to Young Housewives that was published in 1861. I encourage each of you to investigate why certain things have been added to different vegetable fermentation. In this case, the black currant leaves, the dill, and the horseradish all have antimicrobial properties. People 160 years ago probably weren't doing sensory analysis of the products that were produced from these fermentations, but rather they were continuing to do what worked. And even to today, we have dill in a lot of our fermented items. When we're talking about salt fermentations, traditional fermentations, we're, we're usually talking about large tanks. And a 7% salt sodium chloride solution in a 10,000 gallon tank requires 5,800 pounds of salt. So if you're looking at a huge tank yard, a thousand tanks, that requires 5.8 million. Most tank yards do a good job of reusing as much brine as possible, but some brines must constantly be disposed. So for the next few slides, I'm going to talk about no salt fermentations. No salt brines require no sodium chloride, but rather use only calcium chloride to create a perfect osmotic pressure for the fruit and desirable microorganisms to carry on fermentation. I'm gonna get a little bit technical here, but this is absolutely necessary because we're talking about sodium chloride and calcium chloride. Sodium chloride is written chemically NaCl, one sodium, one chloride. Calcium chloride, on the other hand, is written CaCO2, one calcium, two chlorides. Calcium, like, unlike sodium, is a divalent cation. It is often added as a soil amendment as the two cations act as a bridge and build soil structure. We often, when we're talking about waste streams from pickle plants, we often talk chloride discharges. But this is only because chloride is easier to titrate for than sodium in brines. The chloride is actually benign. Sodium is the issue environmentally. Sodium disrupts soil structure and binds to sites preventing soil to hold needed nutrients where calcium does not. When we're talking about a no salt pickle fermentation brine, we're truly talking about no sodium chloride, but we are talking about still using the calcium chloride and the potassium sorbate. And generally to these fermentation brines, I add no vinegar. I weighed out the typical ingredients for one gallon of both equilibrated brines, and I took a picture. For one gallon of traditional brine, there's 261 grams of salt. Traditionally, 
most people attempt for a 0.45% equilibrated calcium chloride. This turns out to be 17 grams and a small amount of potassium sorbate, 1.3 grams. The no salt brine has no sodium chloride, but it does have 34 grams per gallon of calcium chloride and 3.4 grams of the potassium sorbate per equilibrated gallon. The no salt fermentations for whole produce are not restricted under any patents. A no salt fermentation process on modified produce to achieve a pick, quick pickle cure are, and I will refer to this as the AFIRM process, and it, my contact information is included in the last side for more information. For the AFIRM process, Fruits and vegetables are modified by piercing, slicing, shredding, or dicing. Calcium chloride brine solution at close to a 1% equilibrated is added to the submerged produce. The mixture is cultured and kept in a warm state. There were a lot of questions about the culture we use in the pre-questions, so this morning I added these, this information to it. The culture is generally lactobacillus plantarum. I generally buy it at 100 billion colony forming units per gram, and I add it at a rate of 0.0001%. I did the math this morning for what I'm currently paying for it, and the culture cost is about $8 for 8,000 gallon tank. There were a lot of questions about culture companies and I'm really easily accessible by phone or email and my contact information will be at the end. And I recognize there was folks around from around all the world. So I can email you culture companies that are closest to you. With this AFIRM process within days, the mixture is fermented and shelf stable. This process works well in gallon jars, five gallon buckets, 55 gallon barrels, one ton totes, or tanks. And the picture on the right, we show product that was uh, fermented and stored. And this process works on whole produce, but it requires more management. So for time's sake, I'm not gonna discuss that now. Traditional items and new items by a firm. Diced and sliced jalapenos, cucumber relish, chips or slabs, sliced green tomatoes, cauliflower, radish, and carrots can all be fermented with this no salt fermentation. Be besides standalone products, all can be turned into ingredients. An example for this is if the price of radishes or carrots is better before the Napa cabbage is ready when making kimchi or mixed pickles, you can turn them into an ingredient to add later. The next three slides show a traditional brine and a no salt brine. I started these jars on Sunday for this presentation. I took pictures and created a slide at one hour, 24 hours and 48 hours. The traditional salt brine was at 6.9% salt and through these pictures, you can see is, is a hurdle for the fermenters. In this slide right here, I took 250 grams of carrot and added to each a 16 ounce jars. Note the buoyancy of the carrots in the traditional brine. When we were looking at the picture before of traditional brining on a tank yard, and those four by fours and the headboards, you can imagine if this tank was 10 or 12 feet deep, how much pressure there would be pushing upwards. There's also a loss of, of yield going on with traditional brine as the water is being driven out of the fruit. At 24 hours, I took these pictures. The no salt brine has become cloudy. The carrot slices in the traditional brine continue to float while the carrots in the no salt brine begin to settle. I also took a picture from the top looking down and you can see how cloudy the brine has become on the no salt brine and how um, 
inhibited the salt is to the uh, to the lactobacillus plantarum. But this being said, when you go to a traditional fermentation in a tank yard, this isn't a bad thing. You don't want a fast fermentation in a tank yard. A slow fermentation usually give you, gives you better results. But after 48 hours, the traditional brine is still clear. The pH has changed very little and the carrot slices are still floating. The bacteria in the no salt brine is very active and the pH has already dropped in 48 hours from 6.3 to 3.3. After fermentation is complete, the salt must be diluted from the traditional brines, but also the calcium chloride must be reduced below 0.4% equilibrated in the final product. This can be achieved by a simple rinse or dilution with ingredients that have no calcium chloride. AFIRM allows for exciting, innovative new items, fermented carrots, green tomatoes, hot peppers, radish, turnips, and cauliflower. This process allows a grower to turn their raw produce into shelf-stable ingredients. And it's easier from these items to produce low or no sodium items. We have held carrots, cauliflower, and jalapenos in barrels outside for one year and then packed into finished products and done shelf life studies that were very promising. AFIRM promotes sustainability by faster fermentation rates using fewer inputs, reducing salt discharges, and allowing a closed system that can lead to a processing plant with zero waste. This process is worth consideration for many reasons, and I greatly appreciate being able to share my ideas with you today. And if any of you have questions or would like um, further information, like I said, my website and uh, my phone number are going to be on the last slide. Forecasts. We discussed trends from the past and a new process to consider for the future. But now I would like to discuss important forecasts for specifically fermented foods. Three forecasts for all fermented foods. The health attributes and complicated flavors created by fermentation are going to become more valuable than ever. Labeling and marketing are always key, but for the fermented foods category, Knowing the intended consumer and sales venue are critical to optimize success. Growing environmental concerns are going to become more important and company behavior will become more transparent. Health attributes of food will especially become more important after COVID-19. Folks are looking to boost immunity, reduce their weight, and they're looking for nutritious options. The immune system defends the body against infection. Now more than ever, we realize how important this is to our quality of life. What we eat matters. Under healthy weight, when we think about one of the first slides that showed the quantities of vegetables that are produced, you would have to eat 29 pounds of cucumbers or 13 pounds of carrots daily to maintain a 2000 calorie diet. And under nutritious, we are just learning about so many compounds produced during fermentation that add to the nutritional value of our products. Increased research and understanding will really help promote this category. Fermentation of grains into meat like, pro like meat like products is gaining in popularity. Huge investments and in progress are being made to promote alternative proteins. This slide shows cultivated plant-based and fermented alternatives in terms of dollars, $1.5 billion spent in venture capital in the first half of 2020. This slide breaks out venture capital in just fermented, nearly a half of a billion dollars in the first half of 2020, 
Competition is getting stiffer and fewer companies are competing for more dollars. I live in Mount Olive, North Carolina. There's a Burger King in town. I live in the country. I drove there a couple weeks ago and purchased this impossible burger. The large burger chains are experimenting with plant-based meat substitutes. 24% of the U.S. population ate more plant-based protein in 2019 than previous years. In person, impossible burger technology uses yeast to produce, produce heme from soybeans, the compound that makes meat taste like meat. Well, what does this have to do with us? These fermented burgers, if they become popular items, can easily be complemented with fermented slaws, chutneys, fermented green tomatoes, as well as fermented relish and cucumber pickles. And I will have to say this burger was absolutely phenomenally good. Um, but the price wasn't. This burger cost me $5.99 in um, a local fast food Burger King restaurant. Labeling. Hopefully it will be as, advantage, ad, as advantageous to attach fermented as it is fresh packed to shelf stable pickle products at some point in time. Online purchases with COVID-19 have increased greatly. So your brand recognition and labeling may be seen on the internet first. A 2019 food and health safety survey found over 30% of those surveyed were interested in natural, no added hormones or steroids and raised without antibiotics but also that recyclable packaging and viral friendly and sustainability and sustainably sourced were important. And I took this picture of a non-fermented uh, uh, shelf space because I didn't want to talk about anybody's products specifically. GIF was owned by Procter & Gamble years ago and they obviously carried on the idea that size mattered. GIF is on every shelf, but I think what also sticks out here is their labels. You know, you come up to the shelf and you have a hard time finding the Peter Pan and the Smuckers, but um, GIF is in plain sight. But I, I think sometimes we underestimate this. Labeling is even more important when selling your brand. Know what is important to the folks that are going to make the decisions to add your products to their store shelves. Whole Foods is different than Walmart. Ingredients, packaging, and reputation are now more transparent and ever, and they matter. The other thing about labels, don't make labels so complicated. Projected yogurt sales are projected to drop 10% by 2024. And this is partially because there are too many choices and the category has got too complicated. My passion has always been the environment. I took these pictures from my living room where I was sitting while preparing this presentation. I live on a farm. I have chickens, Mediterranean donkeys, cattle, and a dog named Grace. I have fruit trees, nut trees, blueberries, grapes, and a garden. But I was, represent less than 15% of the US population. The majority of the 7.8 billion inhabitants on earth are dependent on someone else to produce what they eat. Global food systems are said to account for 26% of greenhouse gas emissions. And no matter where I go in the world, no matter what continent, no matter if I don't bring up the topic, water is a topic of concern that's brought up to me. Too much, too little, or not as pure as it should be. 78% of consumers are concerned about the environment. This is globally. But when you break this down into countries, there are differences between countries in their level of concern. And some of these numbers really surprise me. 
Upcycling was Crown Cambridge Dictionary's Word of the Year in 2019. And this goes right along with environmental issues and handling what's considered crop relish. We normally think of relish as the byproducts from cucumber products, but there's relish in every industry, whether you're dealing with sweet potatoes or apples or, or cauliflower. It is estimated that 40% of the food we produce is not consumed. According to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, 1.3 billion tons of food is wasted annually. 1.3 billion tons is 18 times that 72 million tons we showed went back and forth to the moon for cucumbers 120 times. So 1.3 billion tons represents a huge waste. Upcycling is a verb that means to reuse, discard a material in such a way as to create a product of higher quality or value than that of the waste itself. This means turning what we produce into alternative food products for humans, our pets and livestock, energy, or composting it to add nutrients back to the farm fields. Upcycling is a global initiative. 12 companies have been recognized for tackling food waste and these are all around the world. I looked up the websites for every one of these companies and in, if you're interested, I encourage you to also. I also encourage you to look at what's in your dumpsters. You paid for everything in there and now you and the rest of the world is paying for it to be removed. The trends and forecasts and processes like upcycling all have one theme, change. My great grandparents' house in Germany was separated from the neighbors by dirt mounds on which they grew vegetables. My great grandparents immigrated to the US from Schleswig Holstein in 1887. My grandmother was born in a sod house in Nebraska, long winters, short summers. My grandmother preserved everything from green tomatoes to watermelon rind pickles. She was upcycling and she didn't know that it was going to become a trend. I took the last picture a few years ago. This is now the land that my grandmother's family homesteaded long time ago, and it's now a cattle pasture. Never in our history has the power of positive change been more possible and necessary. And I think there's just an inherent history with fermented vegetables and a trajectory that can only take them higher going forward. I wanna thank you. I really enjoyed putting this together. I think I could have spent days on every topic. So it was a quick fast through, but um, thank you very much for um, helping me share this today. All right, thank you. Um, great talk. Um, <clears throat> as, I was, as you were talking, I was looking at the questions coming through. <clears throat> Pardon me. And um, uh, there are a lot of really good questions. Um, uh, I made some notes. And um, uh, before we go to uh, some of the audience questions, I wanted to ask you one or two myself that, um, mm -hmm. you know, relate to the technology uh, many people are interested in. One one issue that you brought up was the uh, high percentage of salt that's in a lot of uh, vegetable fermentations, a 6% mm -hmm. um, sodium chloride salts. Um, can you talk a little bit just briefly, um, talk about uh, the desalting process that's typically used in industry? Um, and, and Yeah, sure. Because people aren't eating 6% salt pickles. No, no. So through time, people have done a really good job of reusing brines from the initial fermentation. So when these pickles are being in the fermentation state and in the storage state, they're generally at 6.9% salt. And people are surprised to learn that they can stay in tank yards in this state for years and the quality can main, be maintained 
well. But when you go to consume these products, um, there's been more of a concern for sodium. So sodium levels have gone down, but a lot of the items that we produce, like sweet relish, the final salt levels in those are only one and a half percent. So if 60% of that package is relish and you want to get it down to one and a half percent salt, you have to discharge, you have to reduce the salt levels in those products. And that's where this disposal comes in. So many of the tank yards right now producing these products, they ferment the product and then they ship it to a manufacturer. And so many times these manufacturers are seeing um, these issues with salt discharges and disposal. Now, fortunately, a lot of these manufacturing plants are in big cities and dilution is sometimes the solution to the chlorides. But I think, um, I think what took me a long time to really understand is if you have a high salt content in your waste stream and you are treating that waste yourself, you want to put that the water back in the creek and the sludge is gonna move off the property, the sodium that stays with that sludge becomes the issue. So the chlorides are rel relatively benign. They're easy to measure. That's why we measure the chlorides, not the sodium, but the sodium is actually the culprit. So in soil, it, with soil issues and, you know, for a lot of these streams, they're freshwater streams. And at the same time, they're trying to um, treat the wastewater. They're also treating really high biological demands. So, but it, but it, it's an issue there, but, it, but one thing I don't want people to take out of this is the industry has done a great job. 1988, we were fermenting pickles and storing them at 45 salometer. They were 10, 11, 12% salt. So the industry has taken it down to the lowest level they can. And so I know in some people's minds are like, well, why don't we just go lower? Why don't we go below the 6.9? Maybe we can go to five or four and it's an absolute disaster. 6.9 is the lowest that you can hold numbers of tanks without, without risk, without worried about spoilage. And what happens if you go lower, then you're allowing some of the bacteria that are inhibited that percentage to do what they do. And generally what happens is then you get softening and some off flavors. So it's about the advantage of, the advantage of bulk storage, really. Um, yeah. So that brings brings me to I mean, a follow up from that would uh, directly be when you're taking this um, uh, salt out, you're also taking out the lactic acid that's naturally produced by the lactic acid bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm aware that a lot of the pickles that you buy in the grocery store today taste like vinegar. They have a lot of acetic <laughs> acid flavor, right? Mm -hmm. So um, so it's a question of, of um, lactic versus acetic acid flavor. Um, and I know that uh, some, some people really like lactic acid, natural sort of the original type of um, fermented pickles. Can you talk about um, trends with that or uh, lactic versus acetic flavor? Um, yeah, you didn't really touch on that too much. Um, yeah, and, and this gets a little more complicated. So in the past, uh, a lot of the big manufacturers and a lot of the independents produce what they call a genuine dill. So it was, present, it was fermented in a solution where you would um, use the brine and the pickles in the same jar. And in these jars, you didn't generally add vinegar. So the taste was only from the lactic acid. Now, these fermentations are extremely hard. They're a hundred times harder than a salt fermentation. You know, I on the bottom of the slide where I showed the process, I wrote all these conditions make a difference. Well, they all make a difference, but at the end of the day, they're really pretty simple. And, and what I meant by that difference is if you're fermenting small cucumbers, you have less sugar. So you're gonna produce less acid and the pH is gonna be higher, a little bit riskier, but the process still happens. If you're always fermenting two Bs, three As, larger cucumbers, well, there's plenty of sugar in there. And the fermentation is going to go to completeness and the pH is going to drop to 3.0 to 3.3 and your tanks will be fine for long periods of time. So the process is in, in itself isn't hard. 
if you do it consistently. But for a newcomer coming in, you, you have to be careful at the special little nuances. And, and th this is an interesting fact, and um, Dr. McFeeders taught me this, that um, when the pH drops below 3.7, the magnesium ion falls out of the chlorophyll molecule. So that green cucumber now turns into that bronze looking cucumber. Because the cucumber went from green to bronze doesn't mean it's fragmented. It just means the pH drop. And that's where a lot of folks around the world, three continents, big producers, an absolute disaster because they were, they knew their fermentation should take two weeks. They were seeing these beautiful cucumbers in their tanks, beautiful color, beautiful smell. They weren't checking for sugars or acids. They were looking at the pH and they were finding, oh, my screen went off, this is. You're, you're all right. Oh, okay, okay, it just went back to, uh, <laughs> we had a little technical difficulty here. <laughs> so, um, so, so the tanks weren't fermented. And then when these folks went to desalt, they cut the vinegar level down to them when the fermentation took off. So they were making all making hamburger dill chips with beautiful looking cucumbers, but they weren't completely fermented yet. So when they put them in the potches and the pails, they exploded. So, you know, when you know what you're doing, you can do it well. And, and I'd like to send a kind of a shout out to these tank yards because the majority of these tank yards in the United States, they have a wonderful story to tell. Most of them are third, fourth, fifth generation. These are hundred year old companies. They have been through so much and still producing. So I, I think there's alternative processes and sometimes they're right and sometimes they're not right. Let me, let me ask you one more um, on, on some of the technical aspects of fermentation. Uh, and that is about purging. Um, there were a couple of questions about purging um, I think um, a lot of people don't understand what that is, and that's primarily for cucumbers, um, right? And so could you give us just a, a brief, um, I don't know, uh, explanation of what purging is and why people do it? Okay. Um, well, 30 years ago, we only purged with nitrogen. Well, when I started my career, we... Say what purging is. What, what is purging? <laughs> <laughs> we, okay, yeah. So purging is... Um, putting a stone or a device into the bottom of the tank or somewhere lower than the surface of the tank, forcing air into this device. Generally, it's done through three quarter inch, half inch, quarter inch tubing and allowing this air then to diffuse up into, generally it's a PVC pipe. Lots of times it's four inches, but it can be four inches, two inches, six inches. And with this air going up in the pipe, brine is being carried. So brine and air are being forced out the front. So what you're basically doing is transferring what is next to the cucumber to another area. So you're equilibrating the brine and actually moving the brine. What you're really trying to do in this situation, uh, especially with cucumbers is critical in the first four days, is remove the carbon dioxide. So there's certain bacteria that can convert the malic acid in the cucumber into CO2. And when this happens, it causes bloating. So if I'm, if I'm fermenting a tank of relish and I'm gonna cut this all up, I can ferment it for a few, few four, three, four days, and then I can turn it off because basically the tank is equilibrated at this point. The cucumbers are 95% water. You have this huge osmotic potential driving the water out and the salts in. So what happens then, it doesn't matter. But with whole cucumbers, I have seen even product in barrels, better than 50% of the centers blow out. There's a tremendous amount of pressure that's created at these times. And I think what people don't think about, and it's really interesting, if you, if you have a cucumber in the house today, I suggest you do three, three things. One, pick the cucumber up and smell it. There is no odor. Two, cut that cucumber and smell it. It has an odor. But three, take that cucumber and see there's actually carpels in there. There's actually like there is oranges. It will peel apart. So I love to think about what was this before I wanted to do something with it? 
<laughs> and a cucumber was a pocket for the seeds. It yeah. didn't yeah. intend to be a hamburger dill chip, didn't intend to be relish. It tended to be the, it tended to be the next generation of that plant. So there's inherent areas in there. You know, you have a skin around the outside that is the same as a seed packet if you had seeds bought in the store. And in the center, that area is really weak. So as the cucumber matures, that area tends to break down. And so um, with bloating, there are divisions in there that we don't necessarily look at if we're chomping on it whole or cutting it up into chips, but they exist. And if you don't purge, these slight differences in pressure um, make a difference. I actually have the jar right here of the carrots in the no salt fermentation. And it's hard with the light, but the, um, you can see the pressure of these still going up versus this is the no salt fermentation. It's completely the opposite. The carrot fermentation has settled. Yeah. So um, I see Amelia's um, rejoined us, but um, I just wanted to um, reiterate um, on, on this um, the purging topic briefly that it was kind of like a fish tank pump is the way I mm -hmm. think. You, you push air down, the um, air coming up through the tube carries the brine with it. It flows out the top and the gases float away uh, and you can degas the brine that way. So that's, that's where we have to But um, Amelia, um, I know we must, we've got like a thousand questions here. Um, maybe you could um, fire off a few from the, from the audience. Yes, we do. We had quite, we had quite a lot of questions. Thank you, Lisa, for addressing, um, especially we had a lot about like the waste to taste, you know, how we can use some of our waste more sustainably and turn it into food. What type of upcycled ferments have you seen on the market? So it looks like there's quite a few people that are doing stuff with uh, tomatoes. I don't know that they're generally fermented, but this is a category that really needs to be investigated. And um, ways to taste. I, I think this deserves a webinar in itself because if I'm talking globally, I have lots of times no concerns about this other produce that you buy in local marketplaces. But in my travels all around the world, I think it's kind of sad to say that most of the apples we buy in the store are dipped in calcium. Most of the bananas that we eat have been treated with ethylene. Most of the cucumbers in the grocery store have been dipped in wax. When I watch um, pineapple production in Central America, these these pineapples are put in high chlorine solutions and then um, dipped in wax. So inherently when these items, when these products are thrown out, I guess my concern would be to give, talk too much about this subject is what is, what's carried with it. A few weeks ago, I was working on a product looking at citrus and I was amazed to read the label on lemons to see how many oils and antimicrobials were placed on them because we generally don't eat the skins. So I think the thought is we throw those out. So what I think's got to happen through time is people that are interested in doing this, and I think it's one of the most wonderful ideas that there ever were, they need to partner with the folks that they want to get these byproducts from. But there is not a vegetable out there that couldn't be turned into something else quite easily with a fermentation. And, and I think what's more exciting about the fermentation part of it than some of these folks that are doing drying it and, and, and then bottling and converting it to something else that also carries its own waste stream is you're not, you don't have to add energy to it. That, that was why I kind of designed that energy slide because you can see there's energy from photosynthesis already in these products. You can use the microorganisms then to convert that. If you're taking a byproduct and then you have to dry it to dryness, you have to put a lot of energy. And maybe that energy is a byproduct of something else. I, I like to real quickly mention something because I think we think this is new. And for a lot of it, it, it is a new idea. But um, several years ago, there's an automatic rolls place in Gardner, North Carolina. We went there on a visit. Mm -hmm. This automatic rolls produces 2 million 
2 million hamburger deal buns every day for McDonald's. Every day, 2 million hamburger deal buns. And they send out two trailers of trash a year. I mean, this is, this is huge. And I, you know, I was thinking on the way down here, I mean, some of the questions I have about this is what's gonna drive it? What's gonna drive us doing better? And so, you know, there's such a diverse, receptive attendance in this fermentation association that I would love to see a webinar on this by somebody that's actually doing it and then see possibly some groups putting, being put together that can throw ideas into the pot and somebody can take this as far as they can. But I, you know, Mother Earth is suffering and 1.3 billion tons of food that we've already put a lot of energy into for that to be wasted. I really think it's unacceptable. So Lisa, do you see these trends, this trend like of this um, uh, upcycling um, occurring in other places around the world as much as um, here, or is it more there than here? Um, is it more in the developing world or is it more in the uh, developed world, so to speak? I, I would have to guess it's more in the developed world. You know, when I go to the grocery store, I don't see an apple with a bad spot on it. You know, it just, there's a lot of produce that we find unacceptable. And, and it's a shame because when I go to this, these other countries, the produce is so good. It's so unbelievably good. When I was living in Turkey, I had a place on the Marmara Sea and the family that owned the facility, lots of times I would come home and find a bowl of cherries or a bowl of peaches, local, in season, the, these, some of these areas have tomatoes that are undescribable. They are so unbelievably good. And, you know, we kind of, we want to go for a low price. You know, I, when looking for this presentation, it was interesting because I found data where we are paying less for food per decade since the 1970s. Food costs are less for Americans then the cost of living increase. So these grocery stores are consolidating and there's competition. And that kind of means our choices are being limited. But I think this pandemic, as much as I wish it hadn't happened, is going to propel changes. And I think honestly, they can propel good changes. And I will say, I know a lot of the people that are attending this webinar really don't get to see the attendee list, but there were people from South Africa to the North Pole, and people on every continent around the globe. So this enthusiasm in the asso these association really has to be propelled. So I, I, I really appreciate um, being able to speak to the group today. It's been wonderful during COVID to have a, <laughs> a little project to uh, work on at the house. <laughs> Thank you, and that's a, that's a great idea to do a future webinar on the waste to taste. Mm -hmm. um, another question we had for you, you mentioned how labeling and marketing would be, is key for uh, advertising and putting together fermentation products. We had a question from an emerging brand that asked, mm -hmm. how can we most efficiently reach those who are maybe still a little off put by fermented vegetables? Yeah, and I think that's an issue. Even when I showed in the beginning, you know, slides, you know, we label here in America fresh pack, but we don't label the fermented. And lots of times um, with the cucumber industry, the fermented kind of becomes the offshoot. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of the have to do so you can produce all the fresh pack that you want and still have a home for the others. But, you know, I, I really think that with this COVID-19, that people are paying more attention to what they're eating. And I am really hopeful that some of these other fermented products, you know, Burger King and McDonald's aren't putting these fermented burgers in their menus because they're overly concerned about our health. But they are concerned about trends. And I think there's a whole group of millennials that um, eagerly get on the website. 
So social media, a few successful items, um, looking, understanding what the item you want to promote can encourage. You know, I think it took years for me to recognize that I didn't need to follow a formula. I needed to understand why I was doing what I did. And that's why I kind of introduced that book. I mean, that was 160 years ago. They figured out those herbs protected fermenting cucumbers. We still use that today. But, you know, I'm 60 now. And I grew up with black and white TV. I grew up with the card catalog when I went to college. I grew up with no cell phone. But look what we have today. So I think you can't look at what we have right now. You have to be a visionary and say, what do we need and why do we need it? And, and success doesn't happen in a day. I've been seven years on the road promoting what, I, what I'm passionate about. And for the rest of my life, that's what I want to do. But, but I stepped out of a very comfortable position to do this and I wouldn't step back. My life has been unbelievably phenomenal and I, I'm happy where I'm at now. And so I think, you know, you gotta sit down in a quiet place, not Google search and get all confused on different th pathways, but you need to say, what do I like? What can I be passionate about? And how does this fit in the mix? But then you talked about marketing and labeling. I think one thing that I get really turned off on, there's these new um, beverage products. And I walk up to the category and I feel like I'm walking into a carnival. There's so many bright colors. And you, I, I look to see just how many labels you can put on a container and there's over 150. You know, after you put three or four or five or six or seven or eight, I'm already confused. So you have to know what your product is. And I, you know, and if you don't, you have to learn because the internet is gonna make, make things more transparent. If you're doing things you should, that'll be promoted. If you're doing things you shouldn't, you're probably going to get hurt by it. Sounds like natural and simple is a, is a good way to go. But that's interesting because I think that that's maybe not the way to go in the pickle category because it's made it too complicated. And the other thing it's done is if I walk up to a category and there's regular, natural, and organic, and simple, which one do I buy? And I'm only going to buy one of them. <laughs> I'm only going to buy one. And if it takes me a month to eat that jar, I'm going to, it's going to take me a month to go buy and buy, back and buy another one. Now, I think we're Coca-Cola, kombucha, some of these other things. I, I, I think I saw a statistic where President Trump drinks 12 Diet Cokes a day. 12. 12 he drinks. But he doesn't eat 12 jars of pickles. So I think depending on the category and the volume you want to sell, you have to match what you're good at to to what you want to label. And I don't think Walmart and Whole Foods is the same and it's not the same market and it's not the same clientele. And there's an advantage to being in one and not the other. And you've got to kind of decide where you go with that. Otherwise you have four labels, four SKUs, you know, it just gets out of hand with logistics. Lisa, thank you so much. This has been a fascinating presentation and I think you've inspired some hope in all of us for the future of <laughs> yeah. our food industry. <laughs> no, there's a tremendous amount of hope for the fermented pickle industry, a tremendous amount change, positive change, yeah. but a good trajectory. Yeah. Well, thank you to all of you for attending today's webinar. We will be posting a recording of it on TFA's website in the next 24 hours. Um, and we are excited to see all of you next year with our new lineup of speakers. Uh, our first in on January 21st will be on miso, traditional flavors with modern application with Hiroko Shimbo, Kirsten Shockey, and Kyle Connaughton, moderated by Robert Donnie. Please go to fermentationassociation.org to check these out and register. And while you're there, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks again, Lisa and Fred. No, thank you. Thanks, thanks Lisa. Great talk. I love no, you. Thanks to both of you. Really appreciate it.
right. Bye everyone. Bye.